The Allen Lund Company thanks all the hardworking drivers who are moving goods across the country. We can't do it without you. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. Many truckers are aware of a California law called AB5, which is designed to determine who is or is not an independent contractor. And for some time, we told you about a lawsuit by the California Trucking Association and OOIDA. But there is another case challenging that law. I'll get the details from OOIDA's Advocacy Council, Paul Torlina. Some truckers are expressing confusion and concerns about standard drug testing required in the industry. I'll find out what's happening and get a primer on what's required from Felisa McCannon and Joe Boswell of CMCI, OOIDA's Drug Testing Consortium. And finally, a new bill in Wisconsin would tackle so-called nuclear verdicts in the trucking industry. Scott Thompson covers that, plus bills in two states dealing with speed limiters and underride guards with our state legislative expert, Keith Goebel. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. The sea sign of diesel prices continues. According to the Energy Information Administration, diesel averaged in at 3.86 a gallon last week, up nearly three cents compared to the previous one. The national average has been hovering around the same level for weeks now, up a few cents one week and down a few the next. This past week, prices rose in six regions, dropped in three, and remained the same in one. The Rocky Mountain region had the biggest decline of 5.1 cents, while the lower Atlantic had the biggest increase of more than 9.5 cents. Things look similar according to the ProMiles.com numbers this week, where the average Tuesday morning settled in at 3.83 a gallon, down 1 cent from the same day last week. Now for a look at the latest spot market numbers, courtesy of DAT. Overall, the market is still pretty soft. DAT says low-to-truck ratios were down for van and reefer last week, while flatbed stayed relatively flat as well. Rates were also a mixed bag. The van rate remained steady at $2.17 a mile. The reefer rate down $0.03 cents to $2.58 a mile. And flatbed up $0.02 cents per mile to $2.54. But it's not all bad news. Robert Rouse, Senior Product Manager for DAT Freight and Analytics, says we can expect more demand over the next couple weeks. Well, we are down from last year's numbers for this time of year. Uh, We did see similar load volumes in both 2017 and 2019. Um, In both of those years, we saw a slight increase in freight volume over the next two weeks. Um, This is largely due to two major events in the United States that really drive consumer spending. One, most truckers might know, is the Super Bowl is coming up, and the other is Valentine's Day. Both of those are huge consumer holidays, which drive a lot of of spending, uh, which means there's a lot of goods that need to get to market. And so that's going to drive a lot of on-demand goods over the next couple of weeks. We'll have full coverage of all the latest information from the spot market on tomorrow's show. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is forging ahead with changes to the CDL skills test. They are laid out in an upcoming notice of proposed rulemaking. The changes include giving applicants the option to take a CDL skills test in a state that isn't their home state, allowing commercial learners permit holders who have passed the CDL skills test to operate commercial motor vehicles on public roads without a qualified CDL holder in the passenger seat, and removing the requirement that an applicant wait at least 14 days to take the CDL skills test following the initial issuance of a commercial learner's permit. FMCSA says the change are in the name of efficiency and flexibility. Once published in the Federal Register, the public will have 60 days to comment. A federal judge has dramatically reduced the amount of money Warner Enterprises will have to pay as part of a discrimination case. A jury awarded Victor Robinson $36 million in damages last year. But last week, a judge reduced that sum to $335,000, which is the maximum payout according to federal statute. The trial revealed a practice at Warner of not hiring hearing-impaired drivers. Robinson, who has been deaf since birth, received an exemption from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration from the hearing regulation in March 2015. He received a CDL less than a year later, but just before starting Warner's orientation, program, he received a call from the company's vice president of safety and compliance, who told him he would not be hired because he could not hear. 
New York and New Jersey are sounding the alarm about toll evaders and the trucking companies that are some of the biggest violators. Last year, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey recovered $25 million in unpaid tolls, a 14 percent increase from the previous year. In most cases, the penalties were small and the matter settled, but repeat offenders have been taken to court. In 2023, six of the 10 largest civil judgments belong to trucking or transportation companies, headlined by E.M. Padilla Trucking out of Weehawken, New Jersey, which was ordered to settle more than $200,000. In an attempt to curb toll evasion, the Port Authority has increased targeted patrols, streamlined and improved internal data collection, and leveraged license plate reader systems and police technology. Toll evasion information is also being shared with regional partners. A Wyoming executive order has been revised to adhere to new federal guidance on emergency relief. The emergency declaration initially provided relief from the maximum driving time requirements for all motor carriers, delivering heating fuels such as propane, natural gas, and heating oil. But in accordance with the new FMCSA rule that went into effect in December, there is now a distinction between relief provided for residential and non-residential fuel deliveries. Under the revised order, drivers transporting heating fuel for residential use in Wyoming are granted a 30-day exemption from the required maximum driving time. Drivers hauling non-residential heating fuel are provided 14 days of relief. The relief for non-residential deliveries runs through February 2nd, the residential waiver through February 18th. Low supplies of heating fuel are the reason for the emergency declaration. A new feature has been added to the New Mexico landscape. The state's Department of Transportation has hit the switch on electronic signs that indicate how much truck parking is available at all six rest areas along Interstate 10. According to a 2020 poll conducted by the I-10 Corridor Coalition, 78% of New Mexico truck drivers said they spent more than 30 minutes on average searching for safe parking. A reminder here that the American Transportation Research Institute is asking for more feedback from the trucking community, this time over driver detention. The short survey asked motor carriers and owner-operators to share details on their experience with driver detention and how it relates to their operations as well as their strategies for mitigating detention. Later this year, Atri plans to release two additional surveys as part of this research, one for company drivers and one for shippers and receivers. Atri's Research Advisory Committee has identified detention time and its consequences as an issue that needs more research. To take part in this latest survey, head to truckingresearch.org. And finally, Travel Centers of America has two new locations out west. The new TA Express in Littlefield, Arizona, off Interstate 15, includes nine diesel bays and 210 truck parking spaces, along with three dining options and other amenities. The other in Blaine, Washington, is off Interstate 5 and includes 30 truck parking spots. That's Lane Line Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. You can write a letter to your elected officials in Congress or look up contact information for lawmakers who represent you on the state and federal level by using the website fightingfortruckers.com. Again, that website is fightingfortruckers.com. Starting Thursday, Marty Ellis and OOIDA's tour truck, The Spirit of the American Trucker, will be at the Wheeler Ridge Petro in Lebec, California. That's located at exit 219 on Interstate 5. Stop in, say hi to Marty, and join OOIDA for a $10 discount. If you'd like to support the OOIDA Mary Johnston Scholarship, you can donate to the fund. Just send tax-deductible donations to OOIDA Foundation, Inc., 1 Northwest OOIDA Drive, Grain Valley, Missouri, 64029. Next, I'll discuss a lawsuit challenging California's independent contractor law with OOIDA's Paul Torlina. We'll cover standard drug testing required in trucking with Felisa McCannon and Joe Boswell of CMCI. And Scott Thompson discusses a bill that tackles so-called nuclear verdicts in trucking with state expert Keith Goebel. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. 
For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now. Welcome back. A court case in California could have applications in the trucking industry, and OOIDA has stepped up to make that case. Here to discuss what's going on and why it matters is OOIDA Advocacy Counsel Paul Torlina. Paul, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. My pleasure. Um, this involves a case called Olson v. California. Um, can we start by kind of outlining roughly what that case is about? Sure. The Olson case, is, as it's commonly referred to, is a case brought in the state of California tra- challenging the AB5 bill that was passed several years ago. And the crux of that bill is it was a way to codify case law in California that established what's called the ABC test. And the ABC test is a simple analysis that's done by courts to declare someone an employee when they're trying to figure out if they're an employee or an independent contractor. You're an employee unless you, A, are free from the direction and control of your employee, B, work outside of that employer's usual course of business, and C, engage in trade similar to the work performed by that potential employer. The hang-up in the AB5 stuff normally when you're talking about the ABC test is your ability to satisfy the B prong of that, and that's performing the work outside of the employer's usual course of business. So... The Olson case applies to plaintiffs who are Uber drivers and Postmate drivers. And their essential claim is that as people who are driving to deliver goods or driving people around, they're doing exactly the same business as what the entire app-based entity is out there for. They're doing exactly the work that's performed or offered by the service that the app stands for, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, And the reason that's a problem is it means they will always be considered employees because they can't fall under any of the exemptions that AB5 offers to other industries and other types of uh, workers in the industry. And I I think that's a key part of this case is the exceptions that have been offered, which I guess were were added after the fact of AB5 being passed into law. Can you give us just a couple of examples of the exceptions that have been offered by California? Sure. There's two big ones, um, and they will come into our discussion later on here about OOIDA's case in California. But one of them is for intrastate truckers. If you do not cross the state lines, you get treated differently than an interstate trucker. So the intrastate truckers got an exemption from the law to be considered employees. And then trucking in the construction industry has also gotten an exemption. So that would be an example of people who are hauling materials to job sites or hauling uh, prefabricated components of a building or some other type of construction project. Now, that kind of feeds into one of the key concepts in this case, which is the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And the Olson case contends that AB5 violates that Equal Protection Clause. Uh, Just for uh, folks that aren't familiar, can you kind of explain in layman's terms what the Equal Protection Clause is? Sure. The Equal Protection Clause at its very basic level is a clause in the U.S. Constitution that protects citizens of one state – from being treated differently under the laws of citizens of another state. So an an example here, just to stick with California, if there's a law that applies to California citizens in an inequitable or a different way than it applies to citizens outside of the state of California who come into the state, then that law is subject to challenge under the Equal Protection Clause and essentially says you got to treat everybody the same. You can't treat someone differently just because of their citizenship in a state or because they belong to a different group that the law applies to differently. And that's where we get this thing with the intrastate and the interstate truckers is that's what they say is violating that clause, right? Exactly. And the Olson case is doing exactly the same thing because what they're saying is that there are other what's known as like the gig industry in California – um, people performing single jobs and moving on to other um, other work for other entities. Um, there are other people who were provided an exemption that perform gig work, but 
Uber drivers and Postmate drivers were not provided that same exemption, even though they essentially do the same thing. Each each ride in an Uber car is a gig, or each Postmate delivery is a gig, and it's a separate job each time. Okay. Now, this is now a case that's at the appeals level. Um, what courts or panels have ruled so far, and, and what were their rulings? So, initially, the California District Court had a ruling on this case that they dismissed the case, um, and then it went up to the Ninth Circuit on appeal. And the Ninth Circuit said, no, the Uber drivers and the Postmate drivers are actually making a claim here under the statute, uh, AB5 statute, and, and their claim is valid, and it needs to go back to the trial court and be heard. And so what happened historically in this case is the Ninth Circuit made that ruling with a three-panel, three-judge panel back in March of 2023. And for whatever reason, the Ninth Circuit recently has decided this case should be re-reviewed on appeal by the entire set of Ninth Circuit judges, which is, that's a rare thing that happens. Um, as an experienced litigator, when you win a case on appeal, and then they tell you they want to rehear it in front of the full panel, you're not optimistic as the attorney who won the case, because your feeling was, well, we won the case already, why do they need to rehear it, and why do we need to have more judges involved? Uh, you, your mind typically goes to now we're talking about politics, and now we're talking about policy instead of what the law actually says. Um, OOIDA has offered what's called an amicus brief in this case. Uh, again, going to layman's terms, because this is involve a lot of legal concepts, what is an amicus brief? An amicus brief, uh, the full term is an old Latin term called amicus curiae, and what that really means is friend of the court in Latin, and really the big picture what an amicus brief is, I call it amicus, I Americanize it like a lot of us do. <laughs> um, an amicus brief is a friendly brief that a party who is not sub not actually a party to the case can submit to sort of bolster arguments or point things out to the court that maybe are not specifically at issue that the parties are going to argue. But in the big picture of how the case goes, they are important points. And so, oh, IDA filed an amicus brief in this case because we're not making the same very specific factual arguments about this case, but we're arguing about AB5. We're arguing about the Equal Protection Clause. And there are some nuances to the argument that Olson case stands for versus the OIDA case that is separate in California. Um, going back to the amicus brief, what did OIDA say regarding this case in AB5 overall? A lot of what OIDA had to say in the amicus brief is to essentially restate their arguments in their own case that is currently in front of um, the district court in California. And there are two arguments that are made sort of in different realms. Um, the OIDA arguments centering on the equal protection claims, they are based on what's called a rationality test, which you have to show under the equal protection uh, constitutional law. If you're going to make arguments that an equal protection um, issue exists and a law should be stricken down, you have to show that a law is either irrational in the way that it was either put together or is applied, or you have to show that it's in inequitably applied to different groups, even though it's the same law. Those are the arguments that OIDA made in their own brief. And really what their arguments center around is that under that ABC test we were talking about earlier, it's not possible for an interstate trucker to satisfy the B prong, which is performing work outside of the motor carrier's usual course of business because the motor carrier is a truck driving entity and an owner operator is a truck driver. They're doing exactly the same thing. But there are exemptions for that if you can qualify under the B2B test in California, which is the business to business test. There's like 12 factors. Everyone's eyes will glaze over if I try to explain them yeah. here. So what I'll say is that Truckers cannot satisfy that B2B exemption test and also comply with truth in, truth in leasing regulations under federal law. So what happens is, as an interstate trucker who has to comply with truth in leasing regulations, you can never get a B2B exemption in California. And that means that the ABC test will deem you an employee every single time. So the arguments OIDA made is that with the conflict created there, that's an equal protection violation because the choice essentially becomes anybody who's not a California truck driver, stay the heck out of California. Well, that's 
that's the crux of being treated unequally under an equal protection claim. California's treating interstate truckers different than intrastate truckers. You've mentioned a couple of times the OOIDA case. This was actually filed by OOIDA and the California Trucking Association, again, regarding AB5. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us some more details of that case, uh, just so folks are up to date on that. Sure. That case, there was an oral argument in November where the trial court heard the case. Um, and what I, we made all the arguments I've just mentioned, um, along with another argument that it was irrational for the California legislature to create an exemption for the construction industry truckers, but not the rest of the trucking industry in the state. So really the basis of that case is to show different treatment of different groups under the same law and also a complete lack of rational, I don't know what the best word is, of rationality, I guess is the best way to say it, rational application (laughs) of the law. Um, in, In that case, we probably projected we were going to wait f- about four to five months for a decision. But now with the Olson case being reheard by the Ninth Circuit, we anticipate the, ca- the court's probably going to hold off and wait and see what the Ninth Circuit does in Olson. It's part of the reason to file that amicus brief is to kind of make our arguments to the Ninth Circuit, even though we're not on appeal in our case yet. So what happens in one of these cases is likely to affect the other. Correct. And I think what happens in Olson is probably going to come first and influence the trial court in the OOIDA case. Now, can I say that for 100%? No, but our judge is a smart guy, and he knows that if he rules a certain way, it is subject to appeal right back to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals again in the OOIDA case. So if we've got Olson in front of the Ninth Circuit right now, the judge can anticipate, well, if I rule in a certain way and then we go to the Ninth Circuit, that whatever happens in Olson is probably going to be controlling here. It's probably going to influence what happens after that decision gets made when it comes up on appeal. Um, You've mentioned the appeals court for the Ninth District. That's federal. Uh, Was the original Olson case or the original OID case in state court? No, they were both in federal district court in California. Um, So when you have a case in federal district court, it gets appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the federal Court of Appeals. So the next step for the Olson case, just to reiterate, is? Uh, Well, they're still in the middle of briefing. We filed that amicus brief, and there are responses that are due to it. Uh, Usually it's a 30-day deadline for all brief responses. And then they will have a full oral, oral argument in front of the full panel of Ninth Circuit judges. I would anticipate that's probably going to be somewhere in the timeline of May to July. I can't remember if it's already been scheduled, but for some reason that's sticking in my mind that that's our timeline. So it might have been scheduled already. Do you see this going all the way to the Supreme Court? You know, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if Olson will. And the reason for that is it seems to be a very limited and niche argument that's being made in the Olson case. They're really focusing on anti-gig animus. And that's kind of a fancy word for bias, I guess. When the law was made, was there animus against these particular industries? That's not a requirement under the law to prove in order to get an equal protection win. When you're arguing equal protection, you just have to show irrationality or different treatment, one of the two. Animus is kind of a factor of irrationality. It's a way to show irrationality, but it's not required. And the focus in Olson in their arguing the case has been this animus or this bias against gig drivers, but they could still win on other grounds that aren't necessarily on appeal here. And those arguments would be similar to the ones that we're talking about with the OOIDA case. We've certainly talked about animus in our arguments in our case, but we're focusing much more on that disparate treatment between interstate and intrastate truckers than we are animus itself. I I think the Olson case arguments are going to be a little bit more limited than that. Okay. We've run out of time, Paul, but thank you very much for the information and bringing us up to date on all this. You bet. I've been talking with OOIDA's Advocacy Council, Paul Torlina. We'll be back in a moment. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Attention professional drivers, are you behind on your tax filings? You owe money? Integrity Tax Relief Group frees drivers from IRS trouble. You watch the road, we'll keep an eye on the IRS. Call now, 855-976-4291. Dispatch, I picked up that load of steel, so I'm ready to roll. Sounds good. Remember, we're getting paid by weight, so make sure to use a cat scale. (laughs) I wouldn't weigh anywhere else. Forget this accuracy when you check on a cat scale. Landline now, welcome back. 
Some truckers are expressing confusion and concerns about standard drug testing required in the trucking industry. Here to clear up what's happening and why are Felisa McCannon and Joe Boswell of CMCI, OOIDA's Drug Testing Consortium. Felisa, Joe, thank you for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. Glad to be here. Well, glad to have you. Let's start out with the basics here. This involves random testing. Um, and when we're talking about the requirements uh, that FMCSA has, what do we mean by random testing? Well, every t- if a driver is out there on the road and in a commercial motor vehicle that's over 26,000 pounds, um, it's required uh, that they be in a random testing program so they don't know when they might get that surprise and have to prove that they are drug-free uh, or alcohol-free. So it just helps keep the road safe. Okay. And for a driver, walk us through here. Uh, How does the process go? How do they experience this? So with CMCI, our random selection happens two times a year. And with that, we have a membership base of about 17,000. And DOT, FMCSA, requires all consortiums to test at least 50% of their membership base. And therefore, that's about 8,500 tests that we have to conduct a year in order to stay compliant with FMCA's, FMCSA's requirements. It's 10% for alcohol. So we run our random selection, again, the two times a year. So we're pulling um, half of our members up and selecting them for um, random testing. And when that happens, um, we contact those drivers and let them know that they've been selected for the random uh, drug and alcohol testing. And we work to find the best location the best timing for them, and um, truck parking for them if they're out on the road. So once you get that call, we have to send you in because it has to be random. So you have very little time to um, string that along. You got to go in immediately. And unfortunately, it doesn't always mix in with where your driver is located or what your driver's load is, the time of the day, so forth. But we really try to work with our drivers and and plotting that out for them so that they're off the road as minimal as possible and expedite it and get them back out. And what I always go fishing for is to see if there's somebody that's part of their company, a non-driver, non-CDL holder, that could be uh, the DER, the des- Designated Employer Representative, because that way we can communicate with the company through that person, that DER, not the driver himself. Uh, if it's an owner-operator, um, it is possible that their wives, if their wives are involved in the operation, that they can be the DER. Um, it can't just be a wife. She, she would you know, a spouse, they have to be part of the company. But that way, we let them know that their driver's been selected and we try to get it done and scheduled within 30 days. But it has to be a surprise to the driver. Okay. Now, is this process different, say, at a carrier versus through a consortium, or is it roughly the same? Well, it's the same either way. You got, you know, from your total number of drivers, you got to do 50%. So, Every selection, every driver has to be thrown, you know, be be available to be selected. The company still has to meet that 50%. So some drivers might go more than once. Some drivers, you know, might get skipped. It just depends. It's random. But whether they're running their own consortium because they're running their own random testing program in-house depends on the size of them. But an owner-operator, one truck operator, has to be part of a consortium. Okay. Now, as I understand it, there's been some resistance lately from truckers who are being called in for these random tests. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us, you know, and obviously we can't name names here, but some example of what form that's taking. I mean, are people confused about the requirement? Are they uh, just upset at being called in? What's going on? So it's a mix of everything. Um, People are confused about the requirements and the regulations that a truck driver has to follow to be a part of a consortium and to to be in that random selection. Um, There's very specific regulations that are written, and we all have to abide by all of those. Um, You know, we call a, a driver up 
and let them know that they've been selected. Um, it's really out of our hands. We're the messenger. A lot of drivers um, need to understand that they've hired CMCI or any other cons- consortium that they're are available to keep them compliant throughout this process. So we're just the messenger making sure that we're keeping our drivers, our members in compliance. Um, There's no specific um, selection. I mean, it's all random. So I don't have control over who gets called or who doesn't get called to that random selection. Well, I would suspect some people, if they get called up randomly uh, several times in a row, that they think there's something going on there. But if you're pulling 50 percent, that's probably not that unusual of an instance. It's not unusual, and it is very frustrating because, again, we're taking a driver off of the road, and it can be, you know, a 30-minute appointment, um, depending on the location that you're in, or it could be you know, a couple of hours for a collection site to actually get you in the door, get you called up, go through the the process of require uh, providing our specimen, and then getting you back out the door. So there is a lot of frustration, and we understand that. And I guess that's why we work so hard as a team to make sure that our drivers um, are finding a great location a close location, um, a location that we work with specifically so that all the backside of all that work is taken care of. The driver never has to do anything from there other than take the test, get the results. That's how we want to see it. But it doesn't always happen like that. If someone doesn't show up for a random test when they get that call, what's going to happen? Well, they could, it would be considered a refusal. So if you get selected and you're going, you, you need to go. Um, and there's, you know, that's why, you know, if you're dealing with a DER, the DER can pick a time, you know, when it doesn't interfere so much with their business, doesn't interfere with the load. Now, with our owner ops who are, that don't have a DER, and so we have to call them directly and let them know, you know, this is Joe from CMCI, you've been selected for a random, where are you? And as a, a customer service representative, I, I want to provide good customer service. It's already an inconvenience. We understand that. There's no point yelling at us, you know, yelling at yeah. the people that are calling. It's like, <laughs> hey, you sign up for this. You want to drive, you know, you got a CDL and you want them to have your own business. This is part of the deal. You got to prove that you're remaining drug free and not drinking while you're driving. Now, if they refuse a test, that's the same as a positive, That's right? That's the same as a positive. And so, it, will get reported, it will get reported to the clearinghouse. And what happens at that point with that driver? Well, he's got to be taken off the road. He's not eligible to drive. So at that point, it's the same as a positive. So he would have to go through the return to duty process. So we have to go see a, a substance abuse professional, start that return to duty process. At some point, you know... They take a return to duty test, but it, it's it's not worth it. Just people need to go in and take the test. Test when they're called randomly. And just to understand, too, that these are the regulations that we all have to go by. So right. you are in a, in a random selection program. You get called up. You go to the site for whatever reason, you know, things don't go well. Communication is key. You know, we can work with that within some guidelines. Um, But, yeah, it's unfortunate that if you refuse a test, it's actually considered a positive. And those go directly to the clearinghouse. Well, and if you're an owner-operator and you're under load, you've got a major problem at that point. You do. You yeah. know, and, and our approach to that is we're going to do our best. You know, it's an inconvenience, but we're going to work with them. It's like, where are you? Which way are you going? I start looking for a, a collection site that's in route, that's tractor trailer friendly. We bend over backwards to try to find a place for them, but they just need to communicate and cooperate. So you mentioned the clearinghouse a moment ago, that these are are reported to the clearinghouse. And that's another point of confusion people are having. What is the clearinghouse? The clearinghouse is really FMCSA's database to track and monitor those drivers that have been considered positive in their random testing. Or it's even, um, you know, they're testing for 
a reasonable suspicion. So this is just a database that FMCSA has that monitors those drivers. And FMCSA's clearinghouse is something that um, you are, you need to be in it um, to provide that information. But if you're a lease driver or another company driver that is going to another company for whatever reason, getting an addition, another job through driving, the law enforcement, DOT, auditors, and companies run queries on drivers that are in the clearinghouse, and they have to come up clean in order to be hired by the next company. If a company chooses to hire a driver that has come up dirty on a test, then that company needs to know that now they're taking over the requirements of the SAP program, the SAP program. And they have to take on, you know, that follow-up procedure. They have to take on the financial uh, burdens that brings to not only the driver, but the company. And then there's insurance implications as well. Insurance companies want to make sure that drivers... Um, that companies are hiring drivers that are in good standing because you want to keep your insurance rates as low as possible, obviously. You brought up another term in there that I think is important just to define out real quick, and that's reasonable suspicion. And I know that that plays into another place where you're going to be facing a test. What do we mean by reasonable suspicion? Well, if you if you witness directly one of your drivers, you know, smells like alcohol or it has glassy eyes, if it's something that you witness yourself um, and you have reasonable suspicion that they're using drugs or drinking on a job, then you can send that driver in for a reasonable suspicion test. And again, this is not an option at that point. You've got to go in. you got to go in. Once you're Correct. called to go in, you've got to go. And, and generally, uh, when this happens, the driver's probably doing something and they refuse to take the test. Well, it's the same as positive. So... If you, if yeah, we don't we don't do a lot of reasonable suspicion <laughs> tests. Yeah. Well, and of course, with an owner operator, that's an entire thing. And again, I mean, uh, you're the boss, you're the driver, you're the whole nine yards. Right, right. So yeah, if you're an owner operator, you're not going to turn yourself in. So that that doesn't happen. We've got about a minute or so left here, real quick. And uh, one other thing that you did mention in there, Felisa, was pre-employment test. That, you know, and uh, talk us to us a little bit about that and that process. So a company hires you as a driver. One of the requirements that the company has to follow is, is that they have to conduct a pre-employment test. And that is just the same as a random. However, um, they have to have those test results before they can put you on the road. So we do pre-employment tests. We do the DOT five panel tests, just like all the other tests that we run, um, but that's kind of your pass to move forward with the hiring process of any new company. Well, I think we're out of time here, but I want to thank you both for all the useful information. Hopefully, we helped someone out. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Glad you. Glad to be here. Okay. I've been talking with Felisa McCannon and Joe Boswell of CMCI. That is OOIDA's Drug Testing Consortium. If you have questions about drug and alcohol testing in the trucking industry, you can call CMCI at 816-229-5791. We'll be back in just a moment with more of the program. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Stock up on Howe's Diesel Treat, the nation's most trusted anti-gel. And to be safe from the harshest winter conditions, make sure you have Howe's Diesel Lifeline on hand. The fastest acting gelling rescue product. Available nationwide, Howe's products are designed to keep you rolling through the toughest conditions. Visit Howe'sProducts.com. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route. A good driving song. And thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Welcome back to Landline Now. If you were to make a list of things that make a truck driver's blood boil, nuclear verdicts and mandates for side underrides and speed limiters would no doubt make an appearance. 
Those very topics are the subject of new bills in two separate states, and we're about to get into them with Keith Goebel of Landline Magazine. Keith, how are you doing? Scott, should we make a, like a top 10 of issues like that a, make truckers? Like a letterman? Boring? We could do a letterman a letterman list? Oh, man. I remember those. Yeah. All right. We'll work on it. We'll get we'll get the, the brain trust together, and we'll we'll figure it out. Someday. 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 Maybe not today. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> uh, what we are going to do today is talk about Wisconsin, uh, where there has been some talk about nuclear verdicts in the legislature there. And the talk, uh, I think, thankfully, I think a lot of us would say, centers on reining those nuclear verdicts in. What's, uh, what's behind this? Yeah, well, you've got uh, folks uh, talking to Wisconsin lawmakers that um, are communicating that this is uh, this is not good. This is a situation that you know is getting out of hand. It just leads to uh, you know they had a recent hearing uh, with the uh, Senate, excuse me the Assembly Transportation Committee um, that yeah that was what was communicated to lawmakers and what the legislation uh, that it is worth pointing out that there is an uh, Wisconsin Assembly version of this legislation and there's also a version in the Senate. So you've got them in both chambers uh, so the discussion can kind of get underway. It's without... usually a good sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, and I, I will say that there are states and Wisconsin is one of them where it is very common to have bills start in each chamber. Okay. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of states that's not common, but it, it is fairly common in Wisconsin. But hopefully that will expedite the process, especially, um, you know, whenever you've got folks, anytime that you have a state trucking association who is also in support or in opposition, whatever the case, whatever the issue might be, uh, it, it um, uh, can be you know, a, a good sign for, for a bill uh, whenever you've got a state trucking association um, that is a- advocating for it in this particular case. You know, in Wisconsin, the trucking association is advocating for this this legislation that would put in some uh, limitations on non-economic damages. Um, this legislation would have no effect on economic damages. Non-economic damages, of course, you know, stuff, stuff like uh, pain and suffering, mm-hmm. but wanting to put a cap on um, on on rewards, you know, of of, of lawsuits. Um, this particular case, this Wisconsin bill would put a one million dollar cap. Again, these are non-economic damages. Um, they would be damages that could result uh, you know, an injury, death, or, or or other type of loss in an incident involving a truck. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, was communicated to to the panel. They held their initial hearing on on this legislation in the assembly. Did not vote on it, uh, but uh, had a discussion on it. So, uh, hopefully, uh, get the ball rolling on uh, on this legislation. This is one of these topics that I think lawmakers, especially, need help with understanding mm-hmm. because this is mm-hmm. one of these things where, on paper. Somebody suffers a horrible tragedy, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you feel that they are entitled to some sort of settlement to make things right, so to speak. When in reality, if you look at these situations, um, you know, as we know, these nuclear verdicts just get way out of hand. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they're called nuclear verdicts. So it is, uh, I guess, heartening in a way to, to hear that the Wisconsin Motor Carriers Association is educating lawmakers on just what the situation is and, you know, how it plays out in a lot of cases. Um, And we'll see if the lawmakers take this into account. Uh, But it does sound like they are at least listening to the concerns. And again, these are bills in in both houses, as you mentioned here. So Mm -hmm. we're likely to see, it sounds like something here, but as you mentioned, hasn't moved anywhere yet. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Wisconsin, uh, they're in session... You know, for the most part, all year long. So they don't they don't have the same time crunch that you see in a lot of states. Uh, so part of that process is, you know, they come in and have initial discussion on legislation. Um, worth mentioning, I, as I as I said, there's an assembly version and a senate version. They're identical. Uh, so as part of this assembly transportation committee meeting, uh, you had bill sponsors, both bill sponsors, in in discussing it and and uh, providing uh, details um, as far as um, how the problem is worsening. Um, yet, uh, of course, uh, I, th- I think one one of the one of the comments that was made by by a bill sponsor was that you know they've they've got jury awards that 
not that it's common, but it's exceedingly growing in frequency. Uh, you can have you know up to your neighborhood of ten million dollars uh, mm-hmm. being awarded, and you know one of the things that was communicated by those advocating for these protections, putting a cap of a one million dollars on a non-economic damages, is um, they're not saying that, uh, that these lawsuits, you know, that, that they're invalid. I mean, but the amount um, that you know is becoming more customary. And what uh, some of these um, you know, law firms are, are, are choosing to focus heavily on non-economic damages. It's mm-hmm. not – the, the limitations aren't, aren't, as, aren't as much for them. They can have higher rewards going that route. So uh, – and being communicated again to the, to the committee that it is really starting to um, – um, affect uh, the trucking industry. Uh, and obviously, the focus there is Wisconsin, talking about how you know it, it affects even uh, supply chain issues whenever you start getting into this and this frequency and of these types of verdicts being handed out, and then they, they need to rein it in. They need yeah. to be, yeah, they need to make, make, make some common sense changes there. We'll keep an eye on that. Let's move to California here. Uh, we spoke about this briefly on the show last week, but there is a state lawmaker there in the Golden State who wants two things, actually wants a number of things, but two that we'll focus on. Speed limiters for all vehicles and side underrides on all tractor trailers. Uh, Where to start, Keith, here? A lot to unpack, but uh, this one has raised some alarms and some eyebrows, I guess, across the nation. Yeah, you know, um, you've got California, obviously, uh, notable. Uh, We talk about them from time to time. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah, they they, they do some stuff. Not, not, Not that we always agree with it. Uh, well, very rarely do we agree with it, mm-hmm. I guess I should say. But, yep. but yeah, it yeah, definitely is something that whenever you've got California and, you know, there's also very very similar um, idea uh, going in New York State House, uh, the California legislation for the side and the red guards. This would apply to all uh, truck, trailer, semi-trailer that's – uh, in excess of 10,000 pounds. This would apply to all of those vehicles. In, in New York, uh, they're limiting it, it to uh, those that those, those trucks that are in New York City. Uh, they're all along certain certain routes. Um, so, yeah, the California bill, much more all-encompassing. Uh, but whenever you've got two states like California and New York really kind of taking the lead on this sort of topic, it is concerning uh, because you, you're going to – you could potentially see regionally – you know, uh, how it goes in California, um, Washington State, Oregon, would they be looking at that? Um, that's that's totally uh, possible. In New York, you've got most of the East Coast where, you know, regionally lawmakers will look at issues in one state and they will they will start, you know, taking into consideration whether they should be doing the same thing. But, yeah, California legislation that would require it if you are traveling. It doesn't say that you have to be uh, – well, excuse me, yeah, if you are a truck that's manufactured – sold or registered in California, that this would be a requirement. You'd have to have these side guards, uh, these lateral side guards. Yeah, this is the the slippery slope because we've seen, of course, the federal legisl- or federal proposal, uh, at, at least, uh, with regard to speed limiters. And of course, the side underwrite issue is there as well. Uh, as you point out, it's kind of this idea of the slippery slope. Uh, it may just take one of these dominoes to fall for the rest of them to fall. Uh, mm-hmm. I know... <laughs> oh, idea has not been shy in in saying that this legislation in California is flawed in uh, in every way. But uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Doesn't seem like it may be going anywhere, but again, something to keep an eye on here as we oh, yeah. look ahead. Uh, Keith, a pleasure as always. We'll see yeah, you thanks next for time. having me. That's our show for today. We thank you for listening. We're back tomorrow with another one. In the meantime, check out Landline.media for all the latest news and analysis on the trucking industry. Until we meet again, take care and drive safe. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. 
We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.